Vikings. Over a thousand years ago, these fierce warriors swept like a storm through the world. Now, new discoveries challenge what we thought we knew about them. We often think of them as being barbarians. They weren't barbarians. They just had a completely different view of the world to the way that we would look at it today. A discovery on a remote island suggests that the Vikings called on supernatural powers in their quest for riches. They were hostile, violent, and destructive. But evidence now suggests that during a mysterious crisis, they became unlikely saviors. Most dramatic of all is the story of a Viking king named Ivar. In 2020, archaeologists found the remains of the harbor where he docked hundreds of ships filled with slaves. Ivar and his descendants built an empire in the North Atlantic. They also invaded the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, threatening to crush the fledgling nation of England. The dynasty of Ivar changed the course of history. This is their story. Who were the Vikings? And why did they leave their homes to raid and invade far off lands? To answer these questions, we must follow the trail back to its source. Many Vikings originated in Norway and its oldest city, Tonsberg. Vikings founded a trading post here towards the end of the 9th century. Today, the city is home to the Osberg Viking Heritage Foundation. To know why the sea and sailing and ships are important to Norwegians. You only have to look at the map. Look at our coastline. Look at all the fjords and all the inlets and all the islands. And remember that roads are a modern invention. Adhering to a belief system that glorified war, the Vikings may have felt a duty to attack the Christian lands across the sea to the west. But they also had other motivations. So the Scandinavian society was a hierarchy. The possibilities for moving up in this hierarchy was very small. The going abroad, the possibilities of getting resources back to climb the social ladder. And this could have been one of the reasons for risk taking. So they would first travel to gain the loot necessary to establish social status. If you had tremendous fancy exotic things, that established you as an important person. If you had more slaves than your neighbor, that established you as an important person. And now, another possible reason for the exodus of Vikings has emerged. They faced a powerful and unpredictable force. The climate. Information about weather conditions in the past has always been limited. But now, science unlocks extraordinary information about climate history. The climate leaves traces that remain in the landscape for centuries, locked in the tree rings of ancient oaks. Dendrochronology, or tree ring dating, allows scientists to chart weather conditions through the ages. The Old World Drought Atlas is an online resource that looks at uh, European tree ring data going back over a thousand years. The data shows that around 794 AD, a severe drought struck Northern Europe. This graphic map shows the worst affected areas. Scandinavia suffered badly. 
As dry year followed dry year, crops just wouldn't grow. In Western Scandinavia, resources stretched to breaking point. Desperation drove many to extreme measures. Because of this drought that's occurring in Scandinavia at the time, they have an incentive to leave, looking for alternative resources. And at the same time, too, they're finding very rich monasteries from which they can pull portable wealth. You go because there's not much left for you at home. Population pressures in the homeland are forcing starvation in some parts of Scandinavia. In the 8th and 9th centuries, Scandinavians were world leaders in shipbuilding. Using basic materials like wood and sheep's wool, they fashioned sleek and sophisticated longships. In Tonsberg, modern shipbuilders construct exact replicas of these vessels. The Gokstar ship, which they are building a replica of, is the biggest uh, known Viking ship. Probably will use five to six years, which will be a lot longer than what the Vikings would have done, because they could put in, of course, a lot more manpower. And also, it's more difficult, actually, to make an exact replica than the original. The original, you can, nobody can tell you shouldn't have done this. On a replica, of course, you can. <laughs> The team used the exact same methods, tools, and materials as their Viking forebears. Every plank is shaped by hand and hand tools alone. So, for example, the keel is a tremendous job. You start with an oak log, the diameter like this, and you cut it down to the size you've seen in the yard here. It's a tremendous amount of work. When uh, building the Gok Star ship, we are trying to make it as close to the original as is possible to do. That includes using the same kind of tools that the Vikings would have used, and also the same kind of timber for the ship itself, which means, for example, we won't use a, a saw because the Vikings didn't have souls. We can still visit original Viking ships. Archaeologists have unearthed several that the Vikings buried over a thousand years ago. Some of the most famous are preserved here at the Viking Ship Museum in Oslo. The design of the Viking ship is quite special. It doesn't go very deep in the ocean. To sail it, it lay high in the water, so it was very fast. Because of the keel, it was also possible to go very near the coast. So the boats and, uh, and the boat technology was very important. These ships were also perfect for raiding thanks partly to a unique innovation, the side rudder. The Vikings could lift the side rudder out of the water quickly, allowing them to maneuver right up to the shore. A real advantage when launching surprise attacks. For decades, Viking expeditions set sail from Norway, striking west across the North Sea and on towards the rich monasteries of Britain and Ireland. Among them are two proud and ruthless leaders, Olaf the White and the Viking King Ivar. Now, a new discovery in Dublin, Ireland, reveals more about Olaf and Ivar and the international scale of their power and ambition. Hidden in the center of Dublin, the castle gardens are an oasis in the bustling capital. Once, a large pool or lake occupied this site. It was a massive Viking harbor, packed with warships and slave ships. Locals called it the Black Pool, or Dovlin, and this gives Dublin its name. Now, 
Archaeologists uncover exciting traces of the birth of a city. In 2020, archaeologists excavated a large site directly beside the castle gardens. The team dug down through the centuries, uncovering material from over a thousand years of history. And soon they made an important discovery. The archaeologists believe they have unearthed part of Dublin's original Viking harbour. The discovery of Viking ship timber and ship's nails shows they are on the right track. Uh, here we have a piece of ship's timber that we found on the site. It's half of the rib of a Viking boat. The evidence suggests Dublin's Viking harbour was huge, large enough to accommodate 200 ships. But who built it? Could it be the Viking kings who ruled Dublin from around 850 AD? So these characters, Olaf and Eva, kind of burst into the Irish historical scene um, in the early 850s. Um, they're two leaders who are working together. In some sources, they're identified as brothers. And they are politically active for over two decades in Ireland. The new discoveries at Ship Street show just how extensive the Dublin settlement was under Ivar's rule. This was a major international hub, where slaves and other goods were gathered and shipped off to ports around the known world. Through a combination of war, trade and settlement, Ivar and his descendants changed Western Europe helping to create the region we know today. For the Vikings, the project had unprecedented scale and ambition. It was the culmination of a process that started some 60 years earlier, in the late 9th century, when Vikings began raiding monasteries around Northwest Europe. at this time in Scandinavia were not practicing Christians. They were following their own religion. So they didn't have the same moral obstacles from plundering monasteries, uh, which were rich with silver and gold. These monasteries and churches were largely unprotected, which meant that the Norse were able to come over and pillage them without much opposition. They were easy targets. The church settlement is an easy target. Vikings are not here to lose their lives. Vikings are here to gain the plunder they need to take back as easily and with as little cost on their end as possible. They were businessmen. And so they came in, two or three ships. After scouting the area, they knew where they were attacking. In 793 AD, Vikings attacked the monastery on Lindisfarne Island, off England's northeast coast. The invaders killed those who resisted and made captives of the others. They also carried off the church's precious treasures. Soon, others would follow their lead. Vikings didn't set out initially to come to Ireland. They gradually came down the Atlantic, really, and they would only have traveled in, a sum in the summertime. Initially, they went what is called a Viking, you know, hunting for prey. They weren't uh, out to conquer anywhere. They were just plunderers, raiders. They came down the Scottish islands, down along, 
touching mainland Scotland, the north and the west, and then touching the north part of Ireland, Rathlin Island, down into the Irish Sea. By the late 8th century, Ireland had been a Christian country for over 300 years and was home to many church settlements. These monasteries produced art objects and stunning illuminated manuscripts. But Ireland wasn't simply a land of saints and scholars. It lay splintered into dozens of small kingdoms, ruled over by kings and petty kings. These rulers regularly fought among themselves and often took prisoners during these conflicts. For the Irish, violence and slavery were everyday facts of life. The main ways that the landscape of Ireland differs now to the Viking Age is in terms of forest cover. Ireland was thickly forested in large areas during the Viking Age. The landscape would have been less passable than it was nowadays because there would have been these tracts of forest and bog land to negotiate. For the Vikings, the sea wasn't a barrier, that was a routeway. Many monasteries were located around the coast, on islands and promontories. Lying just off the Antrim coast, Rathlin is one of Ireland's most northerly islands. The abbot Comgall founded a monastery there around 580 AD. Living under strict rules of poverty, chastity and obedience, a small community of monks flourished on the remote island for the next two centuries. But in 795, Viking longships headed southwards along Scotland's west coast in search of targets and booty. Rathlin and its monastery lay directly in their path. They would have done a targeted raid, fast in, fast out, as much loot and as much slaves as they could take away in a single trip. Attackers plundered the sacred shrine. Those who resisted were taken prisoner or killed. Then they set fire to the monastery. Traces of the Rathlin Vikings lay buried for over a thousand years. In the 18th century, investigations uncovered a Viking cemetery on the island. And a few years ago, archaeologists made a fascinating discovery nearby. The finds suggest that in their quest for riches, the Vikings called on supernatural powers. In 2018, the renovation of a house in Rathlin village uncovered the remains of a woman. Buried alongside was an ancient brooch. Its presence indicated that whoever this woman was, she died a very long time ago. In Belfast, archaeologist Stephen Gilmore carried out a post-excavation analysis of the remains. Once we'd recovered the archaeology, we cleaned the bones. She had lived a very hard life, 
and there was a great deal of evidence of wear and tear in her joints, evidence of degenerative joint disease, osteoarthritis in her back, evidence of it in her kneecap, her hip joints, her hands, her neck. Basically, she would have lived in constant pain. Hoping to find out more about who she was, he sent a sample of the bone for DNA analysis. The Department of Genetics at Trinity College Dublin is at the forefront of modern genetic research. The researchers here specialize in ancient DNA, the process of extracting DNA from the bones of people who died long ago. DNA analysis can reveal surprising and even shocking information about individuals who lived many centuries ago. Doctoral researcher Emily Breslin is excited by what the Rathalind bones might reveal. The lady from Rathalind is a mystery. Uh, we have this lady who was buried um, on quite a remote island, island in the north of Ireland. She was quite advanced in years when she died. But she is from a time period, a very dynamic time period, which there was a lot of mobility. People were moving via the seaways all over the north of Europe at the time. Extracting DNA from modern day individuals is very, very easy. We can get DNA from the blood, tissues, even saliva. It's a completely different matter when we're dealing with archaeological remains. Much of this material, we're not actually going to get any usable amount of human DNA out of this. But there are some skeletal elements uh, that are particularly good at preserving uh, ancient DNA, what we call the petrous temporal bone, which uh, surrounds the inner ear. Ancient bones are often in such bad condition that survival of a petrous bone is by no means guaranteed. Luckily, the Rathlin remains yield a usable sample. The team carry out the analysis and are surprised by the results. The genetic analysis confirmed that she was female and she was estimated to have almost fully Norwegian-like ancestry with no detectable trace of an Irish-Scottish-like ancestry. She doesn't have the blonde hair and blue eyes that are the sort of stereotypical image of Vikings. She had dark brown hair, brown eyes and a lighter skin tone. I know we all have the idea of, you know, the classic Viking with blonde hair and blue eyes. But we also see diversity. We have got Vikings with, with darker pigmentation as well. The scientific analysis tells us a lot about the Rathlin woman. She was not native to the island, but grew up in Norway. But she's still cloaked in mystery. Who was she? And how did she come to die on a lonely island so far from home? Could she have been with the Vikings who raided Rathlin in 795 AD? She obviously wasn't a settler because there's no evidence of Viking settlement in Rathlin. You don't bring an old woman on a raid or trading mission without a very good reason. You want your ship filled with active oarsmen, active warriors. Her role in a military mission, I think, is it's much more difficult to explain. In this condition, be a part of a working team on a boat is not likely. Uh, and then, of course, you can look at other possibilities. The Vikings may have thought the woman could call on supernatural powers to aid their mission. Is there a possibility that she was their wise woman? You know, you need somebody to 
protect you from the curses of the churches that you're knocking over? Maybe this was this woman's role? Magic seems to be associated with female characters. The female sphere in the Viking Age, in the written sources. And this has actually a parallel in the, in the Greek mythology and many other mythologies that sort of the, the household magic is a sort of a female sphere. What we call magic and sorcery, what they probably would call part of the living world. Also something to do with war, our modern way of understanding this phenomenon. Because magic was probably as real to them as electrical objects are for us today. Whether or not they believed they had supernatural assistance, the Vikings continued to raid monasteries with deadly efficiency. In 807, they burned the church settlement on Inish Murray of Ireland's west coast. It seems the same raiders then continued down the coast in search of further prey. Located near Galway in Western Ireland, the peninsula of Roscam looks southwest towards the Atlantic. Roscam is best known for its medieval monastery, probably founded around the seventh century. All that survives are the remains of a small church, a graveyard, and a round tower. Today, this seems like a remote rural area, but during Viking times, it was a major hub of European trade. So much so that it's attracted a research team from the University of Minnesota. Researchers Steve Matthews and David Woodward believe that before many European cities existed, Roscam was an important international center. They use remote sensing technology to find out more. It works by shooting a pulse into the ground. It refracts back disturbances in the ground. And what we're looking for is we're looking for uh, refractions that show human habitation or human, so right angles, um, square features, longer features, that wouldn't necessarily be a geological feature. The data suggests this open field was once crowded with buildings most likely workshop areas. We know that they were um, working a lot of iron here. We're looking at ironworks and forges. They were milling grain here. They were doing leather work. And really monasteries operated as a craft center for the local area. Roscam would have been a center of industry and trade where all sorts of goods circulated and a tempting target for the Viking raiders. It's hard to know what the Vikings knew about Roskam before they came. It may have been a target of opportunity, but the site certainly was connected with much larger trade routes in the Atlantic. The trade routes which we know were begun in the Bronze Age with the Phoenicians that stretch from North Africa, Egypt, up the coast of Spain, all the way here to Calway Bay, north to Scotland. These trade routes would have been known to the monks at the time, and if the Vikings didn't know where they were coming at the time of Roskam, interviews with monks would tell them exactly where the monasteries were. When we think of Ireland today, we think of it as a land. When you lived here in the 6th, 7th, 8th century, you thought of it as a gateway to the water. The water is the highway to the world. The Vikings understood this, the Irish understood this. What this says to me is that the Vikings knew and understood there was a rich monastery here at Roskam at the time they hit it. The medieval Irish annals are year by year records of important events written down by monks. An entry for 807 AD chronicles the attack on Roskam. The heathens invaded Roskam. The moon was turned to the color of blood. The moon turning to blood, often that's interpreted as an eclipse. 
But that's our own modern thinking. We think, okay, a blood moon means an eclipse. A blood moon just means the moon is red as blood. And that can happen from a very Viking-oriented cause, fire. When you burn things, especially on a massive scale, uh, the moon turns bright red as if it's washed with blood. I'd like to rethink our understanding of monks. Monks at the time are not cowards, they're very brave. Blood is the symbol of martyrs, and that goes all the way back to the very early church. Tertullian, the church father, said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Vikings won battles with nasty weapons and a vicious attitude. Monks believed they would always win the war by outlasting it. Even so, the Viking raids had a devastating impact, both physically and psychologically. People lived in fear of the threat that lurked on the sea. Wherever the Vikings struck, the only trail they left was the blood washed out with the tide. The quick fire raids continued for decades. The Vikings carried off their booty and returned home. But from around 840 onwards, they started to establish more permanent settlements. To the Vikings, the sea was everything. It was their highway, a means to travel, to raid, and to trade. So when they decided to set up permanent bases, it made sense to use sites on the coast and on rivers. These settlements grew into towns. Something that has really been quite revolutionary in archaeology over the last 20 years is an understanding about how big some of these early Viking camps were. Excavations at sites like Woodstown, Dublin, Repton, Torxey has shown that these were very large settlements, so they were almost town-like, and you had lots of like affiliated industries, people repairing stuff, people doing textiles, people sort of doing metalwork and trading. Dublin was very important and very attractive as a proposition uh, to gain a foothold because it sat on a river that went inland, deep inland, but also. It's located between two Irish kingdoms, Brega and Lyne, Leinster. So it was a border area where there was a bit of natural friction, military friction, and uh, they capitalized on that. They were superb opportunists. Dublin became one of Europe's most important Viking towns. When the Vikings arrived there, many native Irish people were already living in the area so they used force of arms to gain a foothold. But they still had need of the local population. So the Vikings came, were attracted to Dublin, not just by the Liffey, but they needed roads and they needed access to fields and they needed foodstuffs. Well, they had to have interaction with the hinterland and the Irish. They must have been trading with them or they would not have survived. So the population at Dublin wasn't massacred or disposed of in any way. They were literally conquered. The Vikings who settled in Dublin may have managed to subdue the local Irish, but they quickly faced a critical threat to their power. Around 850, a new contingent of Scandinavians headed for Ireland. The Irish call them the Dark Foreigners. When this group emerges, they are in conflict with other bands of Vikings that are in Ireland. One group is called the Dark Foreigners, and one group is called the Fair Foreigners. Using the terms dark and fair in other contexts in Irish language, they can sometimes mean new and old. The idea of maybe older being fairer, more eminent, and newer um, sort of then having slightly negative connotations. The new or dark foreigners were led by two formidable Viking kings, Ivar and Olaf the White. They seemed like a different breed, more ambitious and ruthless than the fair foreigners. And soon, they showed their predecessors who was in control. The dark heathens came to Dublin 
made a great slaughter of the fair foreigners and plundered the naval encampment, both people and property. Ivar and Olaf were now in command of the Dublin settlement and its extensive harbour. They had come with big ambitions. With routes by sea to Britain and Europe, Dublin was perfectly positioned for international trade. Its principal commodity was neither food nor precious items, but human flesh. The Norse did not introduce slavery to Ireland. Slaves were very much a presence uh, within Irish society prior to the arrival of the Norse. What the Norse saw was an opportunity to profit from the slave trade because they had the ship technology that could bring them further afield and export these slaves further afield for a higher profit. Slavery was an accepted part of Gaelic life. The difference is that the Viking mentality was, I could almost say, practically nihilistic. But it was also eternally optimistic. They lived for the moment. So to them, if you could fight on your, on your two feet and you, you didn't want to be a slave and you fought back, well, good power to your elbow. But if you couldn't withstand them, then you were fair game. Ivar and Olaf gathered many captives during the raids. They also traded with Irish kings, who sometimes handed over prisoners in return for Viking silver. The Viking kings planned to make Dublin the slave trading capital of Europe. And to realize this, they equipped and maintained large numbers of warriors. Archaeologists have uncovered the truth about this forgotten army, buried beneath this quiet parkland. At Island Bridge in Dublin, the National War Memorial Gardens are a calm and poignant place. The site commemorates thousands of men and women who gave their lives in the First World War. But this place is also connected with another army, one from much longer ago. During the 19th century, railway construction work nearby unearthed human remains from a thousand years earlier. Island Bridge was home to a great Viking cemetery. Archaeologists Maeve Sikora and Barra O'Donovan believe it to be one of the most important anywhere in Europe. The Liffey is on our left, and then we have the ridge that the, the town was built on uh, running on the right, and the railway came in between these. It did, yeah, and I think that's really the reason that all of these discoveries happened. There was a massive amount of industrial activity. Kilmain and Island Bridge is, is a massively important uh, Viking, uh, concentration of Viking burials, and it's the largest west of Norway. Some of the graves belong to women, but most belong to young males, fighting men buried with their weapons. So what's remarkable about Island Bridge and Kilmainham is the number of swords that were found, which is you know, indicative of a, a warrior elite, really, that were operating in Dublin at this time. Work on the War Memorial Gardens during the 1930s revealed more remains. Five other Viking skeletons were discovered. And one of these is actually an incredibly well-preserved skeleton, and again, one of the few complete skeletons that survive. And he was about 1.87 metres tall, so a very, very tall, uh, strong individual. Um, and he was discovered again with his weapons the entire grave was block lifted and brought into the National Museum for excavation in the museum.
The most recent discovery turned up outside this small gate lodge at the edge of the park. During the 2000s, a contractor laying cables here unearthed a sword and part of a spear. Further investigation revealed human bones. And the really unfortunate thing about the 19th century discoveries was that the human remains weren't curated. So this was, you know, obviously very exciting to think that something might still remain. It, it may be the sort of last remaining trace uh, of in situ Viking burials in this part of Dublin. Modern technology allowed for a scientific investigation of the remains. This individual died between about 18 and 20 years of age, so he was a young man. Isotope analysis done on a tooth indicates that this individual did not grow up in Ireland. He was probably born somewhere like Scandinavia and moved to Dublin in his later life. So this Viking sword from Island Bridge, we think dates to the 9th century AD. And we know this because we've compared it with other examples that were found in Norway. So it's a Scandinavian weapon, and it was the weapon of a warrior. This young man had status. He may have been the son of a Viking lord or king. Like the other warriors whose graves lie deep in Island Bridge, he was buried in the late 9th century, around the time when Ivar and Olaf ruled Dublin. Dublin's Viking kings equipped and maintained this powerful army. But why? As pragmatic as they were ruthless, Ivar and Olaf knew that conquering Ireland would be difficult. The range of different power groups made it next to impossible for the Vikings to occupy the country. Easier conquests could be made elsewhere. The Viking kings looked to the land that lay eastwards, across the grey swells of the Irish Sea. In 865 AD, Ivar embarked at the head of a force of Dublin Vikings. They journeyed to the east coast of England, where they joined up with other Viking bands. These warriors were united by a common goal, to conquer England. They are known as the Viking Great Army. They were intent on conquest, Ivar is remembered both in history and in legend of being a prominent leader within the Viking Great Army. We can see him moving between both islands for the purpose of political campaigns. The Vikings moved into Northumbria. With two local kings locked in a bitter civil war, the region was in disarray. Taking advantage of the chaos, the Viking army captured the region's main city, York. Faced with a common enemy, the rival kings put aside their differences and tried to recapture York. But the invaders defeated and killed them. For decades to come, York would be a Viking city. The Vikings then headed for Whitby Abbey on the North Sea coast. These Gothic ruins date from the 13th century, but hundreds of years earlier, an even older monastery stood here. A Viking warband led by Ivar himself attacked and ransacked the place. Soon afterwards, it stood abandoned and empty. In the late 860s, the Viking army invaded the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms to the south, laying waste to large parts of the country. This was a clear change of strategy for Ivar and the other Viking leaders. Instead of making quick smash-and-grab raids, they now focused on conquering large tracts of territory. Ivar's campaign in Britain succeeded beyond his wildest hopes. 
At York, he established a new base, a counterpart to the Viking Kingdom of Dublin. We sometimes have uh, stereotypes of Vikings, kind of meatheads who didn't really plan things out, but to organize such a successful political kingdom that stretched across the Irish Sea, that required a huge amount of planning. Ivar and Olaf had also gathered a huge supply of the most lucrative commodity in the Viking world. In 871, the annals recorded a dramatic event. Olaf and Eva returned to Dublin with 200 ships, bringing with them in captivity to Ireland a great prey of Angles and Britons and Picts. In all, there must have been thousands of prisoners. For the Vikings, these captives were an extremely valuable commodity. They became part of a slave trading empire stretching from Ireland to Scandinavia and the distant reaches of Europe. Ivar died in 873. By then, his reputation was such that the annals called him King of the Norsemen, of all Ireland and Britain. By the time of his death, he controls most of the Irish seaboard region, from the Orkneys, the Western Isles, Argyll, Strathclyde, Caithness, the Isle of Man, and of course, Dublin and York. It's a massive, vast area of territory that one man has carved out in his lifetime. I mean, I can see the term empire being kind of credible in some ways. They certainly cross boundaries, and we're talking about pan-maritime kingdoms here. Ivar's descendants now took up the mantle of Viking power and ambition. One after another, his sons and grandsons succeeded him as kings of Dublin. Territories controlled by Irish kings surrounded Dublin and Ireland's other Viking settlements. In the years after Ivar's death, they and the dark foreigners stayed locked in a delicate balance of power. Neither side could dominate the other. But the Vikings needed a steady supply of captives for the slave trade. So they continued raiding. attacking settlements and monasteries that lay under the protection of the Irish kings. Just north of Dublin stood the Irish kingdom of Brega, centered around the ancient passage tomb of Nauth. The Vikings had attacked and plundered the site in the past. And in 896 AD, they killed Flanacon Machelac, the king of Brega. For Flanacon's kinsfolk, this was a point of no return. And in time, they would avenge their slain king. In 902, the men of Brega joined forces with the Kingdom of Leinster and struck at Dublin. It seems the two-pronged Irish attack caught the Vikings off guard. They were at the height of their power, you know, that they had already won sort of great victories in Britain and Ireland. And so to overturn that, that would have required quite a lot of planning and good luck to achieve that victory. The heathens were driven from the fortress of Dublin and they abandoned a good number of their ships and escaped half dead after they had been wounded and broken. By now, all of Ivar's sons were dead. Several of his grandsons survived the attack and fled to Britain and France. The Dublin Vikings had suffered a devastating setback. But this was far from the end of the dynasty of Ivar. In the decades that followed, Ivar's descendants would recover their fortunes and wage war once again and the greatest battle they fought would decide the fate of England. 
All the evidence we've got suggests that there were thousands of people who participated in the battle. There was a huge gathering of military power by the standards of the time. Where the battle was fought will be where the birth of the nation of England happened.